Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Raivat. I am from the 2022 batch of CS, and this is Chung. This is the TA for this workshop. So this workshop is on uh, introduction to building with large language models, right? Which is arguably the hottest thing in tech right now, which is, I guess, why all of you are here as well, right? Uh, so first of all, uh, if you want the slides, uh, please go ahead to this link and get the slides for yourself. Uh, no, there's no need to keep typing notes uh, while we are doing something interactive. So I wouldn't want you to do that. So please go ahead and get the slides. Let me know once everyone is good with this, then I can move forward. Thank you. Are you good? Okay, let's move forward. So I want to start by asking a question. Who here has not heard of ChatGPT? Right? It's a very uh, interesting question, right? Or who here has not used ChatGPT? None, right? So, and the reason is because ChatGPT can do these crazy, you know, mind, mind numbing things that uh, all of us uh, have found very interesting, right? It was launched, it was la uh, launched by OpenAI last year in November 22. And since then, like it has been a year, almost a year since ChatGPT launched and like all of us have used it, right? So it is based on a large language model under the hood, uh, which is called GPT. So depending on what pricing plan you are on, you will be using 3.5 or four. So GPT strand, uh, stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, which is a type of a large language model, and which is basically the workshop material today. But what are large language models, right? First, before building with them, we should at least know a basic of what large language mm -hmm. models are, right? So essentially, they are just um, predicting the next part of a sentence, right? So if let's say, for example, if I go to GPT uh, and I tell it that uh, as Paris is to France, uh, Tokyo is to, and I stop there, right? In most cases, GPT will tell me that it is Japan, right? So what it is doing essentially is trying to complete the sentence. So even from that one sentence from one example that I was able to give GPT, it is able to understand that the answer it should be Japan. This is what I'm looking for, right? Oh, yeah, please come in. Please come in. Uh, for our new friends, uh, there's slides here. So just get the slides and then we can proceed. Yeah, just feel free to sit down anyway. Uh, make sure you get the slides uh, because the slides have a link to a Google Colab that we're going to look at later on. Everyone good? Got the link? Hmm. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, you can ask anyone for the links to the slides. So as I was saying, right, they're essentially a very, very powerful autocomplete uh, based on some data, 
In GPT's case, it is data from the previous part of the sentence, but based on some data, they predict what comes next, right? And they're, they're trained using vast amounts of data. This is where the word large comes from, right? And the reason why they're so important and reason why we all are caring about it is because they are on the path to artificial general intelligence, which is basically trying to either meet human intelligence or surpass it, depending on which side of the debate you are on. Uh, and it's probably the hottest thing in tech right now, right? Which is why you have a lot of VC, a lot of people with money trying to throw money at AI solutions to make even more money, right? But again, so why are they so powerful? Right. So they can, because they are, they are trained on such large amounts of data sets, they, they can do a lot of variety of tasks out of the box, right? Uh, and they learn from patterns in language. So as we saw with the, the Paris example, right? And they are few short learners. So let's say not, not just for, you know, getting the capital city of a country, but let's say if we wanted to get sentiments or let's say if we wanted to extract some information from text. Uh, yeah, feel free to sit. They can easily reason from very, very few examples, which makes them very, very applicable to business use cases or to solve problems in the real world. Right. And as we discussed, they're very, very powerful um, at autocomplete essentially. Right. But let's say now you might ask, right, like what why should you care about LMs or why should you uh, build with them? Right. So it's okay to think of them as black boxes, right? So I think some of you may recognize this meme uh, on the right side. Abstraction is a keyword that a lot of us are taught about in the very first semester in, in School of Computing, right? And that is still relevant over here. So it's okay to think of uh, large language models as black boxes. Uh, you need to understand what goes in and what kind of data you can expect out of it, right? And you don't have to really understand what's going on under the hood. Of course, that helps, but you don't have to be uh, an expert at it, right? The more important question is, what can you build with it and what will you build with it specifically? And in terms of use cases, so since they are language models, they can do a lot of language tasks out of the box, right? So for example, summarization, translation, uh, programming code generation, sentiment analysis, all these things uh, they can do really easily. Uh, and they can also do other non-language related tasks, which we'll come to in the uh, interactive session of the workshop. Sorry, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we can get the slides here. Uh, okay. You got the link? Yeah, feel free to ask me, stop me in between uh, if you have any questions. And we should now aim to get our hands dirty. So this is the most exciting part of the workshop where we are actually going to build with large language models. Right. So uh, for for working with the collab, uh, I think as we spoke in the uh, announcements for this workshop, you'll need an OpenAI API key. So how many don't have an OpenAI API key? Okay, some people here. So go and get it from OpenAI's website. So you might need to sign up for an account. Uh, it's completely free. Sorry. But I have to explain something. Uh, I think they stopped allowing OpenAI keys to work anymore. Huh? Yes. What? Yeah. Keys to work. Like I was just using one today. I think I'm pretty sure it's okay. Do you pay for GPT four? Uh, we do. That's why. Uh, I got it free. That's why I can. I have to. Okay, no worries, no worries. If 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 you have any problems in getting the key on your own, we have a backup key. We'll give you the key. So don't worry. Uh, try signing up. If it doesn't work, let us know. I I got the credit for different calls. Ah, okay, sure. Um, it comes with like zero dollars unless you need to top up. Ah, okay, sure. Okay, sorry, my bad. Uh, we'll just give you the key. Um, you want to give them the key? Uh, sure. Uh, can anyone try with their own key if, if they're able to make it work? Otherwise, I'll just put it up here. I checked with the console. It will say zero dollars. And uh, whenever you try to access, it will just come up nothing. I, will uh, see the I see. Because no, me, I myself also signed up for this workshop. So I'm guessing like if someone signed up way earlier, the five dollars that they had, maybe they 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 still hold that value. That's what I'm guessing. But don't worry, we'll get you a key either way. I think if a lot of people are facing the same problem, we can just flash it, otherwise we'll just go and give it individually. Yeah, we, we can't. Yeah, no, 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 that's very risky also. Uh, yeah, uh, 
Is anyone uh, able to work with their OpenAI team? Okay, you uh, you, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's okay. Uh, do you have? You don't have your own. Uh, okay. So it, can you? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. And that is also a big account. Uh, okay. Anyways, uh, let me do one thing. I will flash the key here. So let's forget about the part of getting the OpenAI key on your own. Uh, please don't share the key outside of this classroom. Uh, because it is actually tied to my billing account, right? We'll just use it for the class here, right? Let, give me a moment. I'll uh, flash the open key. You can make a new one then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the plan. So we we had that for backup. So I just have to flash the key. No worries. I think you forgot before. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the info. What's your name? Sorry. Joshua. Joshua. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, man. Uh huh. You're doing a cross like that. Oh, okay. I think you should go all around. Okay. Uh, I send it to you, right? Yeah, one. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thanks. Okay, wait, let me make this bigger. I'm sorry, you'll have to type this, but there's no other secure way of distributing it. Uh, okay, okay, let me put it in the presentation. That's a good idea. Okay, wait. Um, okay, I should delete the name. Okay, everyone got the key? Uh, so this is the key. So what you have to do is take this out. So you copy this, then you go to the collab that we have here. Now let's start by first installing all the libraries that we need to do the tasks. So first go ahead and do this. You can create a copy of this collab if you want to save your own progress uh, in the drive. Uh, please take a seat. All oh, right, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's like it's called. It's still here. Ah. Okay. I called my key, right? All right. You share after you're done with the key. Ah, okay. 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 Is everyone done installing the libraries? Just to reiterate, the collab can be found in the slides. So you can just click on the link, go to the collab copy, and after you can run the library installation part, we can deal with OpenAI and the So we need to we need to install all the libraries first before we uh, put in our OpenAI API key. And this key essentially um, allows us to use OpenAI's large language models, which is GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, depending on what we use. You want to say something? Okay. Are you following us? Okay. You have the key, right? I gave you. No, I, I gave you all in the group. Oh. Yeah. All right. That's the backup keys. Like this is the key that I'm showing. Yeah. 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 It's it's fine. Any else we need? All right, everyone uh, with me on this? Uh, is it, can we cut out the part for the uh, key later? It's fine. Actually, it's fine. We can just publish. I'll revoke the key later on. OK, so what we do is we just go in and copy paste the key that you got from the slides. So 
and then you run this. Uh, this API key is very important. Without it, none of the things in the collab will work. So make sure you got this correct. Everyone done? I see people smiling, which I assume means people are done. Okay, so what we are going to do is uh, from OpenAI's own uh, library, we're going to import chat completion, which is uh, basically the function responsible for querying the latest models uh, for OpenAI, right? So once we do that, we're going to try and create a, our first conversation using the API, right? And since we are in Singapore, we are going to ask the GPT to uh, speak to us in Singlish, right? Uh, and we're going to ask, uh, so this is how we are, we are setting the tone of the model uh, in general. And then what we're going to ask is what is money? Right? Any random question. So this, with this, we're just mimicking chat GPT to begin with, right? And then let's see what uh, GPT has as the answer for us. Now, the way to know if you entered the key correctly or not is to see if you got a successful response here or not. Because if the key is invalid or the key is incorrect, you'll get uh, some kind of an error. Right, so over here, like depending on, uh, of course, every time the model will answer something differently, but I'm hoping that in the response you got, there is Singlish in it, and then there's some kind of uh, a Singlish example, right? So in my case, it is the Mula, right? Uh, and there's a lot of explanation, uh, which is very relevant to Singapore, right? So the reason it can do this is because uh, GPT was trained, as I said, on very, very large amount of data, which possibly and probably included Singapore Singlish as well. Everyone done with this step? Done? Done? Okay, right? So um, since we are here with Hacker School, which is organized by NUS Hackers, right? Let's see if GPT knows about NUS Hackers, right? So we go and run this. Right, so we have a description for um, NUS hackers as well, uh, right? No offense. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but I, from whatever I did in my preparation was positive, right? So, so again, so this means that GPT also was aware of what NUS hackers is, which is probably why, probably because the GPT bought, you know, scroll, uh, like went scrape their website or scrape some of the event websites that they have. Right. So again, the idea is that if you give it something that it has context about, it can tell you about it. Uh, so it's not limited to just English, but also institution. Right. So another thing we're going to do is ask it about mind such an education. So this is the company I work with right now. Uh, and we're just going to ask what we are. We are we are quite a big player in the private education space in Singapore, which is the reason I guess GP knows about it as well. So yeah, we, it gives back an explanation again in Singlish. Now, if you all want to try, uh, you can try asking something, uh, asking it about something that is like famous enough that you think will be in GPT's context. Or we can, I can do it over here. So any volunteer wants to ask something to GPT? They want to ask something. We can do a quick fun demo. If you ever wanted something in the context of a Singlish um, analogy or singlish explanation. Hey, no worries, no worries. Just say, uh, you can ask someone for uh, a link to the slides. All right, sure. We already have the collab part, so we'll go to the collab part. Anyone? Ask about gardening, cooking. Yes. Okay, and then yeah. okay, okay, sure. Let's let's do both of these examples, right? So, um, let's say okay. Tell me uh, about. Oh, yeah. Right. So this is essentially the same as Chat GPT, but we're interacting with the API directly. We're just getting our hands dirty to begin with, and let's see what it says about gardening. 
Okay. Are you happy with the response? Yeah. Okay, then. Okay, let's ask uh, for a joke, right? Again, very common. Tell me, tell me a joke that can. Uh, So why why did the calculus book always look sad? Uh, and then the lecturer laughed and said because it it had too many problems. I I don't know how that was funny, but yeah. So so GPT has its own limitations as well, right? Uh, anyways, uh, let's move on to the next section and where things you know start getting interesting. Something like going beyond Chat GPT, right? Because otherwise, so far all we have done is just play around with Chat GPT. Right. So the thing is. Uh, we so on chat GPT, if um, all of us have used it, right? You you see a conversation that is built up with the large language model, right? And it has some memory of what you spoke to it previously. When we interact with the API, we have to remember for it. It has no memory, right? So we'll see an example of it, right? So the thing is, when you send this particular uh, data back, it has that the the messages array is essentially its memory. It does not keep any memory of its own uh, on the server for you, right? So whenever you interact with the API, you have to provide all of the context that that had occurred between you and the GPT, right? That's, that's, that's easy because it's not using the data to train. Uh, that's a complicated uh, answer. I would say that's a great question. So uh, on the website, yeah, you test out the API. Right at the bottom, there is like sort of a disclaimer saying that you know your your data over here in this. This test page will not be, will not be used, used for you. Yeah, so OpenAI guarantees that any kind of data you send using the API will not be used to train uh, the model. I would say, though, that is not the reason probably why they don't keep the memory, because if, let's say, everyone starts interacting with, with uh, the API, right, it's actually really cumbersome and costly to maintain that state also, right? So they probably had a variety of reasons. This is what I particularly think could be the reason, right? Because API usage is at a greater scale probably right now than the chat GPT itself, right? There could be other reasons as well, uh, but yeah, they, they don't, I, I don't think they do it only, only because they don't want to train the model. Yeah. I think I thought those users are kind of related. Uh, yeah, I guess they're, they're related, but I'm not sure if one is the cause of the another. Yeah. Well, for the ethical reasons as well, we see in a second. Yeah. But, I mean, for the real answer to the question, I guess you have to ask for things like that. <laughs> Yeah, so what we are going to do over here is play around with its memory, right? So if we scroll up and see what it told us about money, right? It, it didn't say anything about uh, money being durian, right? So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say that when I ask you what is money, so over here, pay attention that we, we can define what role that message uh, had, right? So, so far, we have only dealt with uh, a system role which uh, sets the general tone and the general direction of the of the chat and the user is basically yourself right so now we have a new role which is assistant which is basically the large language model right and then i'm saying so when, so now what i'm telling it is that when i asked it what is money it, it told me that money is like durian right and then i'm saying okay in what way right so this is when I can trick it into believing that it said something because it has no memory of its own, right? And now it just continues the conversation from there. So it does not have any memory that, oh, I said money was not durian, right? It just took what I said was correct and tried to continue the conversation from there, which uh, ties back to what we discussed earlier in the workshop about GPT or large language models being powerful autocompletes. They are designed to continue the conversation from there or to predict the next part of the sentence. Yeah? Yeah, yes. Yes, so up until up until here, that was the simulation. Over here, this is something you can do with the API, right? So if you go to chat GPT's UI, and let's say you ask it, tell me about money with a singlish, and, uh, singlish explanation, right? It can do that. But with the chat GPT UI, you can't go in and change what the model wrote, 
right? So this is, we are already starting to see the benefits of uh, working directly with the API, right? And as I talked about abstraction earlier, we are we are now going a layer of abstraction lower, right? So the UI we are interacting with the UI. Now we are interacting with the API, which is where we are able to make this change. Any other questions? Okay, so now we see that our code is kind of messy over here, right? So the response object from OpenAI is, is quite convoluted, which is, uh, so which is why I filled up all the cells with these things so that we don't waste our time. But going forward, since we're gonna write code ourselves, uh, we are going to build some abstractions, right? So let's build some functions that can uh, do the task of asking GPT for us. And so that our code is not uh, messy like it is over here. So let's go and run these cells. So this function is just going to print the response that we get. Uh, this is uh, an overall function to ask something from the GPT, right? And then, uh, you know, let's ask something uh, else about NUS, right? So let's go and ask, um, what is NUS mods? And we should get a pretty good response. So even NUS mods being famous enough, uh, we can see that there's uh, some kind of data in it. Everyone good until here? Sorry. Oh, this is collab. So uh, the answers are not stored. They're just printed here. If I go out of this collab session, okay. it's deleted. But you can store it somewhere if you want to. Like you I can... mean, uh, where you find the this answer when you when you when you type this question? Yeah. Um, sorry, I I think I don't get your question. Like, uh, I think I think like maybe they're talking about a database for the yeah. training model. Yeah, the database. Oh, that is probably with OpenAI. Yeah, well, when I go to chat, uh, chat GPT, the, the history, the real, the real chat GPT page, right? They give me different answer. Eh? Uh, so, sorry. So you mean different answers as compared yeah, to I here? Remember just now the question you asked. Right. I type the same in the chat GPT. Right. Give me different answer. Eh? Right. Right. Uh, that that is perfectly common. Sorry. That's, that's that's the reason why they call it T. The T in the GPT is called a transformer. It's it's mutating the. Output the, the, the process for the outputs. So GPT, so that, that, that's a great question. So his question is that he put the same same uh, question that that we asked over here into Chat GPT, and he did not get the same answer uh, that we see over here. Uh, anyone knows why that is the case? That's perfectly uh, valid uh, to see that. The reason is that essentially large language models are work kind of like probability functions. Right, so you cannot expect a consistent uh, output, especially in terms of style, especially when it is something uh, that is this big, like like a paragraph, right? So if I ask it, let's say, what's the capital of Japan, I can expect Tokyo in the answer, but I can't expect uh, it to say just Tokyo every time. It'll say it is Tokyo, or it will say Tokyo is the capital of Japan, right? So it is trying to complete the sentence with uh, tokens or words that it thinks are the highest matching uh, for that particular uh, input. So we do tune here, so tune yeah, yeah, but that, that is that, that is way advanced. It's not the scope of this workshop. There's one set, just this one setting tune Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, we are, that's not the scope of the workshop. So we we can talk about it later if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Never mind. Go ahead. You continue. Uh, no. Uh, so the reason is that so. Uh, statistically, you can't have the same, well, let's say you might have, even though you ex you ask the same question exactly, you can't expect the same uh, response out of it because it has, it works like a probability function internally. Uh, so everyone good until here? Right, okay. So let's do something interesting. You know, uh, one thing that I remember from my days at NUS is that before taking a class, I would want to see the reviews of a class, right? Uh, see, let's say, what is the workload, right? Like, can you uh, make it in a SEM with internship? Can we do it with other heavy modules, right? So what we are gonna do or what we can do is, I think I took this from CS 2040, but 
what you can do is you can go to NUS uh, mods, right? And we can go uh, to a particular course. So any favorite courses that you all have or any courses that you have been looking to take? CS1010. CS1010. Okay. Any version of CS1010 or just this one? Just this one? Okay. So this one you see has, I'm guessing it has some reviews. Right, I guess it has quite a bit of review content, right? So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take all of this. I know this is a bit cumbersome, but bear with me. The result is going to be interesting. So we scroll all the way and we get all the review data, right? So I'm gonna select all the text, uh, command C. I'm going to go back to the collab that we have. This is what I had for CS 2040, but let me delete it. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, this is huge. Wait, I think I have a better idea. Oh, wait. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. How long is it? Like so. Oh, we can create a new variable. So NUS mods review. And I'm going to create a string here. This creates a multi-line string uh, that you don't have to wait, sorry. Uh, right. So I'm going to run this cell and it should work now. So now what we're going to do is, so now we are changing the system prompt, right? So we are done with having fun with Singlish, right? So we are telling it that you're a helpful assistant whose job is to answer questions based on the following context uh, of reviews from a specific class at NUS, right? Uh, again, we want the Singapore flavor, so we, we want the Singlish slang to continue. But now we wanted to do something even more meaningful, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to pass in the review. Uh, for those who have probably not taken CS 1010 or CS 2040 yet, this, this is called string interpolation, which is basically that we are passing on the review inside of this string, right? So we're going to go and run this. And then we are going to ask some question, right? So you wanted to, sorry, what's your name? Or just, you wanted to ask something, you wanted to take CS1010, right? So you wanna ask like what, what, once you read the reviews, what would you ask? What would you want to answer for yourself uh, when you're re reading the reviews? Can I ask you this one? Okay, <laughs> right? So let's try that. Oh, I SU. Yes. SU means you can take a class uh, as pass or fail. Uh, you can change the letter grade to. Uh, oh, wait, that's just a. Have... No, it, it's still. I, I guess it's still graded, but you, it, the letter does not show on your transcript. Right. So let's see. Even I don't know how it will do on this. Uh, okay, so based on the data, no. So yeah, you can choose the SU option on this, uh, and then it goes, <laughs> it goes beyond that and advises you on uh, your GPA and future plans. Uh, and if you feel that uh, you may not do well, it could potentially bring your GPA down. Uh, so remember, so one thing that NUS students will see over here is that uh, it uses GPA and cap interchangeably, which is, pro which is probably because some of the reviews would have had something like this, right? Sorry? Oh, oh, sorry, I wasn't aware of this. So it's, it's G GPA now? Oh, okay, but it's still, still out of five, right? Sure. Okay, very cool. Uh, okay, in my time, it was uh, cap. I feel old now. <laughs> right, so uh, any other questions for CS1010? from around the room. Oh, 
Okay. What would study for exam? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Uh, and, and also, so it goes beyond. So this is this is a very uh, interesting thing about uh, large language models. Is that for those of you who have some background in computing, uh, you would know that you know when you write, let's say, a program, right? Uh, it will do exactly what you tell it to do, right? If you tell it to go and multiply two numbers, it will multiply those two numbers. Uh, let's say if you wanted to uh, use exponents and you forgot one of the asterisks, uh, it will not do the exponentiation. It will until unless go and do the uh, multiplication, right? Whereas in when when prompting a large language model, right? it can go beyond what you tell it to do, right? So for example, she only wanted to ask, is there a midterm, right? She did not ask how much uh, percentage of the grade was the midterm, but it still gave you this answer. So let's ask, uh, sorry, what was the question that we wanted to ask? Uh, what to study for the exam, right? Okay. What to study for the exam. Final exam, I'm assuming. Okay, so uh, okay, let's say what are some tips to do well in the exams? And if anyone is stuck, please raise your hand. We have uh, a TA was gladly agreed to help us, and I'll also go around. So if you have any problems, this is meant to be an interactive workshop. So please feel free to raise your hands. Okay. Wow, we get a couple of tips. <laughs> right. So imagine the power of large language models, right? Like if 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 you were in the pre-GPT era, you would have to go through everything over here, right? To go and make your own notes and see how to do well uh, in this module, right? Everyone coming out with their own advice, right? But our friendly large language model can do that with just one uh, call to the API. Right. So now as an exercise, why don't you all do it on a module of your choice? Right. And I would say the question, I think let's keep this question. I like this question, you know, because in NUS we are very concerned with exams. So let's try to ask the same question for any course of your choice. Let's go around and see. No, it's not open yet. It's just tied to my yeah, that's why I didn't want to read the piece of first place, but it's fine. It's not that much. So it's fine. It's because can't read it on the internet, otherwise somehow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's based on meter users. So the amount of things that it's in this, it's metered based on the number of words. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
no, no, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, if you're going to talk about it at the end, I think there's a lot of I Anything interesting that came up? Sorry? Total number? 
or, or a farce. Yeah. Well, there are some limitations. <laughs> Anyone found anything interesting? Yes? Sorry, can you repeat? Right, that's that's a great question. So the question here is that, uh, sorry, what's your name? Vinny. Uh, Vinny tried telling GPT uh, that it should not answer questions about a certain topic, right? Uh, but it still went ahead and did that. Now, this is called setting a guardrail, which is very important for safety uh, in AI, right? So let's say if I'm building, um, let's say a chatbot for education for use in classrooms, I wouldn't want it to answer questions that are not related to education. So how do I prevent it from doing that? Uh, so usually the best practice right now is to put it in the system message. But this is, again, this is a very evolving space. So no one really knows what's the best answer for that. But th thanks for sharing. Anything else? Anything interesting that came up? From you guys? Nothing? Okay. Uh, let's move on. And let's do something even more interesting. So using large language models for non-language tasks, right? So we remember how we said that LLMs are essentially autocomplete, right? So when we ask it, let's say to do two plus two, right? They they don't do computation in the literal sense. So, so large language model uh, in itself does not have, uh, let's say um, a programming environment uh, or access to a programming language or to a calculator per se, right? So they don't do two plus two in the same sense that we do two plus two in, or a, a programming language would do two plus two in. It is basically just relying on data in its in its training set, which said many times that two plus two is actually four, all right? But sometimes, of course, you know, people write anything on the internet. So some people may have written that two plus two is minus four, two plus two is five, two plus two is infinity, right? Which is why it is prone to making errors when it does mathematics. And some of you may have read about this in the news, right? People claiming that, uh, oh, GPT sucks at, sucks at math. You know, how can it ever be intelligent? Uh, but the thing is, a large language model was not designed to do that, right? So if we go and do this, right, let's say we want the second derivative of this uh, math, math function, right? Uh, it is possible that it gives me the correct answer. It is very possible that it gives me the incorrect answer. All right, let's see. Uh, I think the answer is correct, All right? Yeah, the answer is correct in this case, but this won't be the case always. Has anyone experienced this issue before where you ask chat GPT some math thing and it fails? It has, can you share your experience? Yeah, I think like, especially for questions that is like not really, like heavily discussed on my right? then it's more prone to make mistakes because there's not enough data set for it like, to train. Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, if that information was not really there in the data set, uh, the LLM will have trouble trying to solve that problem. Right? In this case, second derivative of a fairly simple uh, you know, math function, it probably can do it, but it probably won't do something that is harder. Right. So how do we fix this? Right. We can, sorry, answer your question. Sorry. I missed what you said. Ah, okay, it's okay. Uh, we can find out. So what you can do is you can maybe look up uh, a hard equation online, which has the answer itself, and then you can compare. Cool. So let's let's do that once we do the next step, right? So let's uh, give our LLM the power of a calculator, right? So let's go and import some more libraries. So we're gonna do this over here. And then we're gonna define two functions over here. One is uh, the schema function, which is basically just going to take uh, a Python function and give GPT information about it. So OpenAI has this really cool feature for large language models, which is called function calling, which allows the, the, the LLM to call a function that is sitting on your computer, right? So remember how I said that you know, it doesn't have any programming language uh, interpreter or environment of its own. Uh, it does not, right? But you can give it access to your own. So this is what we're gonna do, right? So this schema function is just going to take a Python function and it is going to give 
GPT information about it. It's not really important for us to know how this works. Uh, this is an interesting function. So what it's going to do is it's going to help GPT call a particular function that is on our computer, right? So we have this uh, list of functions that are okay for the GPT to call. So for now, we are gonna give it to uh, give it this function called run. And what it'll do is if, if the function that it's trying to call is allowed, it is going to go ahead and run it. Otherwise it's going to uh, tell GPT that it's not really allowed to do that. Okay. Uh, so once we run this, we can, so this is the run function. So what this does is essentially it takes in uh, a string of Python code and then it runs it for you, right? So uh, how many of us have not taken an intro to programming class uh, before? Everyone has? How many of us took CS111S? For, for those who did CS111S, this might seem familiar. Uh, so essentially what we are doing is we basically built a function that can actually run a programming language. So we're gonna see an example over here. So let's say if I call the function with a Python code, right? So this inside, uh, the string is Python code. So if true, print hello world, which is of course always true. So we should see hello world being printed, right? So we will go ahead and run this and we see hello world being printed. I know this can take a while to understand. So please feel free to stop me here or ask the TA or ask me if you have questions. Should we do another example of what this function is doing? So since uh, we wanted to give um, the GPT or calculator, right? Let's try to calculate something, right? So, uh, and, and remember we have to write Python code. So let's say five uh, raised to the power three and we want to print that. So, oh, wait. Uh, okay. So, okay. let's think how do I do this? Or let's say, let, let me try this. Right. So we went ahead and did that and we got uh, the result. Now let's say if I write some incorrect code, right? So let's say if false, uh, and this is not syntactically correct because there should be a colon here, uh, we would get some kind of an error, right? Because this is not uh, actual Python code. So what this function is doing is essentially running any Python code that is given to uh, Let's go and fix this. So let's say five. Everyone good? Any questions here? Uh, yep. So I run the function. Does it run locally? Does it run actual Python code on that in the OpenAI server or it runs it on our computer? Oh, uh, so and it means self okay. Yes, exactly. So how the communication will go like is that. I'll say, okay, hey, you can call this function. It's available for use. It'll tell me, okay, I want to run this with this argument. I'll take that argument and I'll run it on my own computer. Because OpenAI does not currently provide any way for GPT to have its own uh, programming language environment, right? So we don't, we don't provide a function description. We just give it a function like the actual code of the function. No, so what we do is this schema function will give it the function description. How does it feel then? Uh, I can show an example, right? So if we, let's say we have this run function, right? So uh, we have the schema function, right? And if I go this, go to this, and then I can uh, say run. So this will give the description to the uh, large language model. And this is in the format that it expects it to be. This is just one like one format that OpenAI mandates, right? So it basically from this GPT knows what the function is for, uh, what is the type of the input, which is of course a string here, uh, and what it what it is going to do, what are the requirement uh, required arguments uh, to call this function. So it's it's a format of specified by OpenAI. Exactly. Yeah. And this function is I mean I wrote this function out for you just so that you don't have to write it for yourself. But it's very easy to come up with. Uh, Something like this. Any questions while we are here? Please feel free to stop me. No? Okay, so now 
let's give it access to this, right? So now the difference we will see over here is that instead of just the system message that we were passing on earlier, you can also pass in uh, the list of functions that you want our LLM to have access to. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask what is 12 factorial, right? I want to know the approach as well uh, that it uses to calculate that. And then in the system prompt, which is used to uh, set the general direction and guidelines for uh, the large language model, I'm going to say that you should use Python, uh, which is via the run function for any kind of computations, right? So now let me go ahead and run this. Right. So over here, if we were expecting the result of this, we were expecting the result of the computation, right? But we didn't see that. Anyone knows why? Okay. The reason is that when we get this response, uh, we are told to uh, call this function, right? So basically in the message that we see from, from uh, our large language model, we are told to make this function call, right? But we actually have, we are responsible for making that function call. And it has correctly given us the argument, which is n equals to 12, right? And then it has written the code for uh, doing that. So what we are going to do is now we're gonna help it execute the function and send the result back to the large language model, right? So what we are going to do is, now we have another role in the messages array. So remember how, in the memory, we had user, system, and we had something else, right? Anyone remembers? We, remember we had a different type of a role. What was it? Yes, exactly. So we had we have system, we have uh, user, we have assistant, and now we have this fourth role called function, which is used to give back the result of that computation, right? So now we name the name the function over here. And we call it, we, we, we give it the content. So what I'm going, what I'm doing right now is I'm taking the uh, 12 factorial uh, input that it gave me over here, right? The, the arguments to call uh, that function. And I'm using the call function uh, that we defined earlier. Uh, and then I'm just sending that data back to our large language model, right? So let's go ahead and do this and see what it gives us back. Right, so now it gives us the answer. It also comes up with an explanation, which is what we asked it to do, right? Uh, I see that a lot of people are confused. So please feel free to stop me and ask me questions. Or if you are too shy, you can ask the TA, you can raise your hand, the TA will come to you. Uh, I know this can be hard, but uh, this is interesting to do. And I think it's uh, really powerful if all of us can uh, learn about this. Any questions at this stage? Can you explain what schema, call function, and run are doing? Sure. Let's go back. So schema basically takes in any kind of a Python function and produces this kind of a description for it, right? This description is used by the large language model to know how to call this function, like what it does, right? So let's say if in an exam, uh, I tell you that this function, let's say I tell you that, oh, you can use this helper function, right? I have to tell you what that helper function is about, right? What does it do? Uh, and what kind of arguments you can give it. So schema essentially gives it in this format. This format is specified by OpenAI, right? And you can easily find this code online as well. It's not something that is new. A lot of people use this uh, today to make real world apps, right? What call function is doing is that if you see in our um, response, when it first when we first gave the, the function to the to the large language model, it gave back this very complex um, you know object back. But it, there was this one thing. There's this function call thing that we have now, which tells us, oh, I want to I want this function to run with this particular argument, right? So what this call function is doing essentially, call func, is that it checks. Okay, function name run is is allowed, is in our list of functions that are okay to run. And then when it, when it is okay to run, it is just going to call that function and then return the result of that particular function being called. 
And what else? Uh, sorry, these are two functions that you asked to explain. Done? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is this is what, what is happening under the hood when we uh, do this, right? And sorry, go ahead. Uh, the Python code to actually generate the Python code was created by the GPT, right? Exactly, exactly. Then how do we like, is there a way where we can give our two own predefined functions and then the GPT can inside this function? Yes, exactly. That's next, that's coming up in the next part of the exercise. Is there a way to check that function call is actually returned? Because when I ran it the first time, it didn't give me a function call. All right. So that, that is, again, a very good question because Sometimes again, the, the the way large language models work is sometimes it may not end up calling that function, right? Because it had some kind of a gibberish output and decided, okay, I don't need to run this function. So actually OpenAI provides a way for you to force that function call as well. Uh, so there is a way to do this. Uh, we don't need to do this over here. It's just one Boolean value that you can set and be like, you have to call this function. Yeah, but yeah, it's certainly possible. Any questions before we move forward? All good? Okay, since we did this exercise, uh, let's do another exercise, right? So uh, I think a lot of people who have done intro to programming would be familiar with this kind of a function, which calculates the Fibonacci number in a recursive way, right? And this is this is one function that uh, I preloaded for you. Uh, another function is uh, basically something that helps you factorize um, an expression, right? So the example is given here uh, for those who are not familiar. Uh, you can also add your own functions here, uh, but the goal is, so then what you can do is you can, so as, uh, sorry, what was his name? Uh, Ojas, right? Yeah, sorry. As you asked, right, you wanted to give GPT multiple functions. That's the goal of this exercise. So so you can either define, you can define your own function, or if you don't feel like doing that, you can just give it access to these two functions and then try giving it uh, inputs where it has to call either of these functions, right? So I can say that, uh, let's say, calculate the 90th Fibonacci uh, number, right? And then, you would expect the LLM to call this function, right? And not this function. So we will go and check that. And then let's say you can ask, okay, factorize, you know, X uh, cube minus nine for me. And then you would expect that this function would be called and not this function uh, to be called, right? So what you can do is I'll just show a quick demo here. So let me go and copy paste some of this. Oh, wait. Copy the wrong thing. Okay, so now I'm going to change this and let's make it an uh, example. Right, so now I'm gonna say what. Factor, right? Or let's say what is the 90th number. Right, In, over here I wanted to, to be able to call um, the Fibonacci recursive function. So, This um, and notice how this functions is an array, right? So we can specify multiple uh, functions in one go that the large language model can use. And the other function we want to give is factorize expression. So factorize. Yep, we got that correctly. And we want the initial stage. So this is all I am going to do. Uh, 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to return the, we will see first what function it is wanting to call, right? And then I will close this. Right. Now let's see what it comes up with. Okay. Oh wait, there's something wrong. Oh, I think I know the answer. Okay. Uh, of that's not a touch thing, something to your description. Oh, I see, 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 I see. Right. So a schema function that we have over here um, expects the function to have some kind of a um, description. So calculates your shape number and then we can have the same thing here so this function lets you run lets you calculate or lets you factorize expressions factorize math expressions right um, okay what's wrong there yeah. oh in the integration Right, we got this, we got this, and we should get this. Uh, uh, let me see what's wrong. The factorial answer. Okay, wait. Uh, oh, we need to print this. Um, Right. So now we see that it came back with a function call and it is, it wants to call that correct function and it wants to uh, call it with the correct argument. Right, so now it knows that it doesn't have to generate the Python code for it. We already gave it a function that can calculate the fib number. Uh, in the call, we said, okay, what is the 90th fib number? We have given it uh, access to two functions, right? We've given it Fibonacci recursive. We've also given it factorized expression, right? So now let's change uh, what we asked, right? So anyone wants to factorize one particular expression? Any expression you want to factorize for fun? Okay, let's let me ask what is the factorization of x squared minus four? I'm just going to make something up. And then we see that it is able to call the correct function that is required, right? So the large language model is able to make this judgment uh, for itself knowing what to call. So how uh, how many of you have used chat GPT plugins? Like, has anyone tried uh, using the plugin on chat GPT? I know right now it's limited to pro users only, I think. So some of you may not have used it, but essentially uh, what I can show is, I have something. So if I go to my own chat GPT, right? I have this GPT-4, which you may not have, uh, right? And then there's something called plugins, which allows your GPT to like interact with other uh, services. So I have Wolfram Alpha, for example, enabled over here, or I can go to the plugin store. I can like, let's say chat with a PDF if I wanted to. So the tech behind this is actually what you just learned. So let's say if I have the Wolfram Alpha plugin, right? And if I go to ChatGPT and ask the same question, what is the factorization for uh, X 
squared uh, minus four, right? And let me zoom in, right? So it says it's using Wolfram, right? So what is going on under the hood is essentially the same thing. It is calling Wolfram alpha using some function, right? But the idea behind something like this and what we just did is very, very similar. So let's let's go back to the let's go back to the collab. And why don't you all try doing this on your own? Some other library, 
Yeah, so you don't put a string inside, you put a double string inside. So if I go in and say, I think the is this is a Thank you. 
so that works very good yeah he has not worked on this for yeah but it is not very yeah but it is not what if you want to see what if you want to tell me I need to put it to the Oh, then, then, uh, the call, 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 call,
You can even like it, so it's just a just like a yeah, I like Response is not a yeah, 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 If the default functions don't work for you, you can modify them like this so that they work. Sorry about the small error. Make sure it has a text here that explains what the function does for both the functions. And then you need to rerun both of these cells. Make sure that the type of the argument is also specified. Thank you. 
The, the type. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep, what's up? You want me to come there? Yeah, 
So let's let's go back to our slides. If there are any questions, uh, you can uh, yeah you can go ahead. Um, for if there are any questions from me, I can take it after ending the workshop. Uh, I'll stick around here for a while. So let's go back to our slides. Right, that was it for the interactive part. Uh, so just to recap what we did today, right? So we know that our LLMs can be prompted to uh, converse in any particular language, dialect, or style, as long as it was in the original data. Right? Now, let's say if you find some very, very uh, niche style of conversation that you have just with your SOC friends, uh, the LLM probably doesn't know about it, and it probably can't converse in the same way. Right? Uh, we need to remember for LLMs when we're interacting with the API, usually, which is what the messages array did, right? So the different roles like user, system, uh, assistant, and function. We need to keep this memory on our side for the LLM for now. Like this may change in the future. And by future, I mean, it could be two months. That's how this uh, space, that's how fast this space is evolving, right? Uh, and, and LLMs don't have to be restricted to language tasks only. So you can work with non-language tasks as we see. Uh, and one way to do that is to augment it with more tools. Uh, right, And the most important thing that I would want everyone to take away is that you don't need to be an expert uh, to work with large language models, right? All of us just tried doing something and we just, I think most of us, uh, or I think all of us were successful in calling the API and doing some kind of magic with it. 
right? So of course, knowing what happens under the hood uh, is helpful, but that should not stop you from going out and building something, right? And this space is attracting so much attention today that let's say if you build some app, right, it's, it's very, very easy to like get funding for it or get traction for it. And then who knows, you know, you could be a millionaire like next time you quit school, right? Okay, that, that, was, that was a bit far-fetched, but yeah, the idea is that uh, this is a great time to be building with large language models, uh, right? And I, I hope uh, all of you at least try that. Uh, so what's next, right? Like this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to large language models. I, we can't uh, compress all of the knowledge in a two hour workshop. Uh, so these are some of the things that you can do next. So one is like looking up into prompt design and engineering. So some of you, when I went around were asking me about uh, prompting techniques, which is of course a great question. So there are many techniques on how to get GPT to do what you want. And that is part of prompt design and engineering. So there are literally courses on that. Uh, I'll come to that later on, uh, but you should, if you can go ahead and do that, that would be a good first step. Uh, it's very important to keep up to date with what's happening in this in this space, because it is changing literally every single day. Right? Every single day you could wake up and have something that is so new or so dramatic that it changes whatever you are building with. Right? So one way to do this is this nice newsletter that my friend runs, uh, but of course you're free to use uh, anything that you want to. Uh, one good resource is OpenAI's own blog, right? Uh, and the two things which I feel are the most important are working on side projects, right? So building is learning, right? Like until you get your hands dirty, you don't know it really well. You, you can you can be the best reader and read the documentation, but it will still not replace uh, when you uh, actually build using uh, the same technology, right? And you could, or you could do an internship, uh, more on this later. Some of you also asked me about it. Uh, so some ideas on what you could build uh, as, as projects, right? So we already saw that the NUS mods example was quite fun to uh, use and quite quite meaningful. So you could do do that, but do it in a better way. So like copy pasting text isn't great. So think of a better way to do that. Uh, you could summarize or you know create insights from Hacker News comments. So if uh, some of you are familiar with Hacker News, uh, there are these articles that are sent there, and there's huge discussions on them, uh, similar to Reddit. Uh, so you could do something like that. Uh, and the third, probably most important for all of you is you could actually use it for assignments, right? So you just saw that GPT can generate uh, code for you and it can generate not just Python code, but JavaScript, uh, Rust, you know, what else, whatever. I think from what I know, it is best at Python, but you could try your luck. Uh, but it's very important to be, of course, be mindful of where LLM can do well and where it can't do well. So don't plagiarize, uh, use it responsibly. But yeah, do use it. Uh, some resources, right? So uh, there are some AI courses that I would highly recommend uh, going on from here. So there's one that is on prompt engineering that I really like, that I, look, that I took myself. Uh, there are some nice examples on OpenAI's websites, some customer stories, some examples on how some people have used uh, the LLM API to build something, right? It might give you inspiration for what you want to build. There's a very nice prompt engineering guide uh, which you can refer to uh, as you continue to build LLM apps. And then there's this nice bootcamp if you want, you know, if you prefer that kind of a um, learning style where you just want to go and do a bootcamp over the weekend or recess week or whatever. Right. So now I'll finally come to about uh, the organization I work for. So a couple of you asked me, and this was part of the Google Colab as well. So I'm part of this new tech team at Mindstretcher Education. We are trying to build a new fast moving tech team. Uh, right so far we only have two people uh, and we are currently hiring for designers uh, and engineers both full-time and part-time so if you like working on cool tech uh, please talk, talk to us uh, and you can email us at this uh, email address and yeah we'll love to chat with you uh, regard regardless of whether it's about LLMs or not and lastly uh, thank you thank you to the TA uh, home uh, and thank you to our NUS hackers folks who helped organize this Right? And thank you to all for attending. So uh, one last thing that I would really like all of you to do is uh, give us feedback because feedback helps us improve. Uh, so please go ahead and either go on this link or uh, scan the QR code for the feedback. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm sticking around for a while. You can ask me, uh, or if you are too shy, you can email me at this uh, email and I'll get back to you. Uh, is there anything else? Oh yeah, just uh, please do that. Uh, and before you guys go, like right, you guys can grab the, <laughs> and but please don't eat inside here.
uh, is outside because those words are not in here. So, yeah. okay, uh, thanks for coming. So, uh, thanks, Robert and Joe. So, Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for helping us. Thank you. 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 Thank you